Welcome to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That's Mr. Graham. That is Mr. Gimby. That is Mr. Raymond. And today, we are standing in front of the National Arch Memorial at the Valley Forge National Military Park. And today, we're going to check out where the Continental Army camped in the winter 1777-1778. So follow us for another Lesson on the Road. Man, it is cold here at Valley Forge today, and I don't think it would have been any different for the soldiers that would have been here in the winter of 1777 to 1778. We're standing in front of recreations of a city of huts that were built by the Continental Army during their time winter encampment here in Valley Forge. Washington brought his 12,000 man army here to camp during that winter, making this essentially the fourth largest city in the United States of America at the time. When the Continental Army first arrived here, there was no shelter, so no huts, anything like that for the soldiers to stay in. So when they first arrived, a significant amount of time was spent clearing all this land you're seeing of trees in order to get the wood to make these huts. Well, Valley Forge is not that far away from Philadelphia. It's important to remember that during this time, military activity stopped. Food was hard to come by. The roads were almost impassable. So this is where the Continental Army had to hunker down for the long winter. This city of huts that you see recreated behind us here right now looks kind of uniform as if Washington gave specific directions to his men as to make them this wide and this long with this many doors or windows, but that's really not the case. Thomas Paine, when he came and visited the encampment, said it, it looked like a city of beavers working day and night to throw together and put up a patchwork of shelters so that the Continental Army could survive this winter. So Mr. Gimby, I think we're gonna go check out this earthworks, a uh, redoubt, right? It's right down the way here, so that's where we're headed right now. No doubt in our mind, right, Mr. Graham? No doubt. No doubt. Hey guys, we're standing in front of an earthen fort here at Valley Forge National Military Park and the technical term for this fort is a redoubt. And Mr. Graham, we just learned that, that redoubt is... We just learned that it's a French word that means a place to retreat to. Everything about this earthen fort would have been designed to protect the people inside of it. So if you're looking at, at this redoubt, which was one of five that was at Valley Forge, uh, first thing you're going to notice is that it's elevated, so that would make it more difficult for the enemy to try to overtake it. And then as you approach the redoubt, there be a ditch in front of it as well as those long pointy wooden sticks which what's the fancy word for it abatis abat abatai abat no abatis abatises <laughs> abatai <laughs> which would make it even more difficult for the enemy forces to try to overtake the redoubt why don't you follow us around and we'll take a look at the inside of this earthen fort abatai Okay, right outside the fort here, or redoubt, you can clearly see the ditch with the parapet and the abatis, the metal, the metal, the wooden logs that, that stuck out of the side, making it very difficult for any enemy force to approach this redoubt, this earthen fort. Why don't you follow us inside? Oh no, almost fell. <laughs> Whew, that wind is cold. Welcome to the inside of our redoubt. And this is a great example of the commanding view that anybody inside of this fort would have had of the terrain out there looking down towards the city of Philadelphia about 15 miles that direction. Without the trees here, of course, there have been no trees and no tall buildings. You would have been just able to see uh, about a mile away, which is a really, like you said, a good commanding view. Yep. To help reinforce the walls, these baskets were made of intertwined sticks and then they were filled with rocks. They were then placed inside the walls to help fortify it from cannon shots and things like that. I mean, this whole thing seems really primitive. I just find it really fascinating that sticks and rocks and earthen forts and logs was so effective against. Makes a good defense. It does make a good defense. I mean, as opposed to building something out of stone, I guess, if a cannonball would smash that, it would send pieces, a fragment of stone in every which direction. This is very primitive, but it's like so effective. I think the overall thought is either the cannonball hits this and glances off or hits it directly and the earth just absorbs into all the energy of that, of that shot. Science. Science. Yeah. The winter of 1777 and 1778 at Valley Forge was actually relatively tame and mild. A lot of people associate Valley Forge with all this snow and these really freezing temperatures, but compared to other winters, it was pretty calm. But what Valley Forge can be known for 
or what Valley Forge is known for is deprivation, the lack of clothing, the lack of supplies, the lack of basic necessities, diseases like smallpox, the lack of food. What food they did have, they would have baked or they would have made in these earthen ovens that you see right here behind me. The uh, huts that we saw earlier were very, as you could tell by the image, were very, very basic. So your food preparation, a lot of it would have been done out here. Did, did you want me to go? Full on nerd on. I want to get full on nerd. Okay. I want you to get full on nerd. Yeah. Okay. And never display some science into our into our lesson on the road. Yeah. As we're calling it a lesson, lesson on the lesson, lessons, lessons on the road. road. Lessons on the road. I should know that if I'm in the video. I really should know that. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be important. Go full on nerd. Are you cold? <laughs> I I'm a little cold. What I really would love though is a fire over here because if we had a fire in that fire pit, we would get radiant or radiation energy from the fire because heat travels in three directions and one of them is radiation which is what you experience if you stand near a campfire if you're cooking in an oven like this you're probably cooking with a lot of convection which is heat rising up from its source or if your food is sitting on a pan it's probably being cooked through conduction that's heat through direct touching i told you it was full under i told you <laughs> Yeah, so Mr. Gimby and I are standing in front of one of these recreations of a hut that a Continental Army soldier would have lived in. And not just a Continental Army soldier. Yeah, you're looking, even though it's pretty small, you're looking at 9 to 12 guys uh, sleeping in this cabin. 9 to 12 guys in the cabin. It's got no windows, one fireplace, probably about 14 by 16 when we're talking about the size of it. Mud floors, maybe if you're lucky, some hay to, or straw to sleep on. This definitely was not luxury living here at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Let's take a trip inside the hut and see what it would have been like. I think Mr. Graham's already beat us to that punch. So we're inside one of these reconstructed huts made out of wood and would have been mud and straw and anything else could be thrown together to patch these huts together. Anywhere, what'd you say, nine to 12 people would have been sleeping in one of these? Could you imagine the disease? Like once one person got smallpox, everybody got smallpox. Uh, this would have been atrocious. And the sleeping conditions, as you can see, Mr. Graham is finding out. Yeah, bring the science teacher to Valley Forge, they said. It'll be fun, they said. You look <laughs> you look bored, Mr. Graham. I am, I'm a little bored, yeah, for sure. Uh, I've been laying here for just a few moments and I can tell you exactly what you said. It is cold, it is drafty, it is uncomfortable. I would imagine, however, this bed and that bed near the fireplace probably would have been a, a pretty coveted in spot. So, although these beds really aren't comfortable, right, you're just sleeping on wood, uh, the one good thing it would do is it would keep you off the cold ground. So in here, you'd at least be sheltered from the wind and you'd have a place to sleep that wasn't on the, on the cold ground. We are standing in front of a statue of Mad Anthony Wayne, which is located in front of the appropriately titled Wayne's Woods. Feeding the army here at Valley Forge was an enormous task. The amount of soldiers that were here required on a daily basis 35,000 pounds of meat and 170 barrels of flour. That's a lot of food. Each regiment was supplied both by the Continental Congress and their home state. So there are lots of discrepancies between how much food and clothing and supplies one regiment got compared to another regiment. And on top of that, if the British could capture supplies coming here, they would. General Wayne is commemorated with a statue here because at Valley Forge he served a vital role in preventing the mutiny of the soldiers. When food supplies were running low, Anthony Wayne led a foraging expedition into New Jersey and was able to bring back a lot of cattle to feed the army at Valley Forge. I guess we should move on. Wow, look at all those chickens. We're standing in front of the house of Isaac Potts, who was the iron master at a local forge, aptly named Valley Forge. Prior to the encampment here, as the British came through, they burned the local iron forges here, trying to limit the Continental Army's ability to wage war and make cannonballs and pig iron. This house behind me has become famous because it was used by General Washington as his headquarters during the time period here at Valley Forge. Now, unlike European armies that would have just confiscated the property, the Continental Army did pay Isaac Potts $100 of Pennsylvania currency for the use of the home. And what did the soldiers think about Washington living in a house like this while they were staying in the huts? Actually, they were kind of stoked about it. Washington, for all intents and purposes, could have just left, could have gone back to Mount Vernon, could have lived in a lot more luxury, but he chose to stay here at Valley Forge and suffer the same hardships that the men suffered as he worked tirelessly to make sure that they were equipped, supplied, and trained. 
Mr. Gimby and I are standing in front of a statue of George Washington that's known as the American Cincinnatus. The American Cincinnatus depicts George Washington wearing his military coat, but it also shows his willingness to give up power once he was done being general. He's carrying the walking stick of a Virginia gentleman and he's standing in front of a plowshare. On the opposite side, Washington is leaning on a bundle of rods called fasces. This is a reference to something that was common in Rome that showed power. The name American Cincinnatus is also another Roman reference. The original Cincinnatus was a Roman dictator who, after leading the Roman army to a successful victory, voluntarily surrendered power, just like Washington did with the Continental Army. The original statue stands in the Virginia State Capitol building in Richmond, Virginia, and there's also a replica in George Washington's Mount Vernon. Man, that is one bad Airbnb. I'm leaving a bad review. <laughs> Actually, the huts that we just walked out of were used by Washington's elite security force. If we're only right now about maybe 200 yards away from Washington's headquarters at Valley Forge, his security force wouldn't be too far behind. Their job was to make sure that the general was protected at all times. Yeah, these men were hand-selected uh, for their sobriety, good behavior, being well-dressed. They're, they're a hand-select group. And this is a tradition we've seen carried on at Arlington National Center cemetery at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Well, I don't know about you guys, but at this point I'm getting a little bit of cabin fever. So Valley Forge is well known for the winter of 1777 and 1778, but besides its winter, it also has a pretty great spring. Our last stop here at the Valley Forge National Military Park is the statue of Major General Frederick William von Steuben, who was a Prussian general who came here to help train the Continental Army. You know, the story of Valley Forge is a story of suffering and hardship, but it's also a story of transformation. The Continental Army that entered Valley Forge in 1777 was very different than the Continental Army that exited it in 1778, and that was due to the training of Baron von Steuben. He wrote the handbook for the U.S. military and really transformed the Continental Army from a ragtag militia to a a professional fighting force. That's kind of a funny anecdotal story for von Steuben. He was used to training military armies where when you tell a soldier to do something, he does it. Here in America, he'd often tell American soldiers to do something and they asked him why, which is a question he was not used to getting in Europe. It's also a question that eighth graders ask us a lot also. Yeah, I imagine they didn't ask that very often after the first couple of times. Yeah. So thank you for joining us on this trip to the Valley Forge National Military Park. Next time you're in southeastern Pennsylvania and you want something seriously nerdy to do, come and check out where the Continental Army trained and camped and became a well-oiled fighting machine. That's Mr. Graham. That's Mr. Gimby. That's Mr. Raymond. And thank you for joining us on this Lesson on the Road. We'll see you next time. Come on, guys, let's go take a field trip. Where did we park? Oh, shoot.